Well, I apologize for being, oh, 20 minutes late. I am Dan Kingerski on the Pittsburgh Hockey Now and the National Hockey Now YouTube channel. Uh, real quick, yeah, the, the MacBook that I'm replacing decided to pick exactly now to take its final uh, dirt nap. The MacBook I bought a week ago had to be returned yesterday, so I had to try to quickly set up this brand new one. Here we go, Penguins Live Chat. Your participation, your comments, and all of that other uh, happy, happy, fun stuff. Let me uh, jump onto YouTube real quick so I can, in fact, uh, share this, let people know we're live. Here's how this works. I start talking. You start talking. And uh, we have a conversation. Uh, the, the, the Penguins, um, yeah, if you've read my last few pieces, and even uh, from the road, I, I think... I, I've really tried to, without being overly demonstrative, emotional, I feel like uh, I've really been trying to bring you what's what's really going on. And and hopefully I've I've kind of helped the, the Penguins fan base at large. I guess I'm one of the four or five people who get uh, the closest access. And um, I, I take that job seriously. Clearly, there are numerous issues some of which are so odd. They're inexplicable. How is Sidney Crosby struggling to find his game? He was probably the most enthusiastic person through training camp, having fun, and, um, you know, Evgeny Malkin has had a very good start to the year. And, of course, there is the million-dollar question, what about Mike Sullivan? We're going to dive into all of that. I've also got some guests coming on. We're going to bring on uh, Francis Anzalone. If you've watched the Coach's Debrief videos on our YouTube channel, you know just how smart this guy is. And, he, you know, he's been in the coaching profession literally his entire life. His father was uh, uh, an accomplished, successful college coach and then a coach in the minor leagues before becoming an NHL executive. So Francis has lived a lot the life. And even went down that road for uh, a moment or two himself. Yeah, Michael, I, I apologize. Uh, yeah, Dan Moore. Uh, yeah, this is the brand new MacBook, and I haven't even—I just literally ripped it open and and got the web web browser up, got into Streamyard, and that still took um, like fifteen minutes because. Oh, what language do you want? What is your what is your internet pat? Just everything has to be set up with a, with a, a Mac and, and all of that. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump onto YouTube so I can share this. I'm going to keep talking as I do it. I don't do this part often because for every time you do what I'm about to do, there are five times when I, I should do the exact opposite and excoriate myself for being entirely wrong. However... If you've been with me for the last 14, 15 months, um, I, I feel like I can say I was right about several very important issues. And both GMs over the last 18 months have gotten them wrong. And that they've and I think both Kyle Dubas and Ron Hextall have gotten something very critical and fundamental wrong because of where they were looking, how they were looking at the team, uh, you know, the, their perspective. They were looking at Crosby and Malkin and Latang in the present and past. There's almost been an assumption they will continue. And they've just been so ridiculously good that you're like, uh, okay, you believe. When they say, I'm ready, we're going to go, you believe. Because they believe. I mean, listen, uh, there was a, a scene last night in the locker room that I, I can't show you pictures of. You know, you, you can't take still photos in the locker room. And, and if I had turned to take video of it, I would have ruined uh, what was going on. Obviously, it was a very emotional night with Mark Andre Fleury. Um, you know, having his final game in Pittsburgh after Sidney Crosby did his media scrum, 
And by the way, some some lunatic was commenting on our other on our Crosby video. I hate when reporters shove microphones and cameras in players' faces. Then every news, every sports section of every newspaper would close and would have closed a hundred years ago. It's literally been that way for a century. But I digress. Um, <laughs> Crosby kind of left his locker stall, but was still sitting in the locker room. He was kind of, you know, he takes the 12 o'clock captain's position in the locker room. He was kind of sitting over around 10 o'clock. And a player came to join him, Chris Letang. And Letang and, and Sid just sort of sat there. Now, I, I kept peeking out of the corner of my eye. We were talking to Ricard Raquel whose locker is kind of at like the 8 o'clock position, 8, 9 o'clock position. And then we moved over to talk to Yoel Blomqvist, who, you know, if you kind of take that horseshoe, is, you know, down around 7 o'clock. And I just kept, I just kept peeking over because I was, you know, I, I, I saw it. And I, don't know, I don't think anyone else kind of realized. And they left before we were done with, with Blomqvist so that I couldn't go uh, hit up uh, Latang to to talk any more about it, but it um, give me a sec. Uh, it was they just sat there quietly. Um, if you've ever seen you know, the the Academy Award winning movie, I know this is predating most of you. And it was I was very young too, but it's still a famous movie on Golden Pond, where Henry Fonda and, and I don't remember the woman. She's very famous, too. At the end of the movie, they're old. They don't remember who they are, basically. And they're just sitting on a park bench talking to each other about the old times that neither of them can really remember. And it just had that that look to it. It just looked like something they had never considered. The end. You know, Crosby re-signed because clearly he felt he had a lot more to give, and he does, and the team could be a lot better than it was. And Latang is still here, and Malkin, and comprehending how they can struggle. I think it is something that, um, I have to take a picture of my QR code, hang on. I'm doing this all as I talk. It had never occurred to them that they could be bad. The team could be bad. This had never occurred to them. I think they're getting a very rude awakening right now. Oh, good Lord. Apple makes more freaking steps to sign on. Just give me what I need. That click on 13 damn thank yous. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, as, as we do all of this, I'm going to show you what uh, I wrote here. Um, I guess I'll have to minimize that i i want to i want to bring up to you so obviously you're here you're you're the primary folks and how many do we have uh, let me get rid of that how many people do we have uh joining us live i i can't even find it on this oh well you know when you're 20 minutes late you can't expect a big crowd can you uh let me share my screen oh for pete's sake Dan's, uh, I, uh, yeah, just let me do it. Select tab to share. Yes, this one. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm going to uh, bring up this story. So I was talking with um, a, a coach this morning. And, and the coach kind of... He, he didn't see what I had already written. And he said, yeah, when you're on the inside, as Mike Sullivan is, 
you know it. You know what's coming. You can feel it. It almost begins to take on a life of its own. The pressure, the feeling grows. You don't worry about it, but you feel it. I think that's where Mike Sullivan is right now. It's the same place that Sidney Crosby and Chris Letang are right now. No one thought this was coming. Everyone thought they'd be 7-3-1. and one. They were better. They were happier. They had uh, torn down the negativity with that great run last season. Uh, they had put some players in place. Kevin Hayes had a great training camp. Yessi Pugliarvi surprised everyone. There are some kids on the way. They all wanted the best, and boom. It's not that they're getting outplayed. It's not that they're getting out coached. It's that they're just not able to sustain their game for any length of time without making ridiculous mistakes. And what's happening, and this isn't on Sullivan, but ultimately it it does occur on his watch and it begins to reflect on him. Ultimately, what's happening, uh, Sidney Crosby is picking up bad habits. He's looping. He's doing the Malkin loop away from the play to keep his speed up rather than stopping and starting and getting to where he needs to be. Uh, Latang certainly is is scuffling and str- you know struggling to uh, find his game. And, and all of these things that Sullivan can't fix, you can try. Make no mistake, uh, you know, you had a point last year when you kind of kept calling for changes and why is Sullivan running this player out time and again? Why isn't he punishing players? Why isn't he doing these things? Absolutely right. And he's doing those things now. Probably a year late, but I don't know that it would change the result in this moment. Sullivan has, in fact, made, I don't know how many, let me think about this. Here's the lines at the start of the season. Bavillier, Crosby, Rust, Bunting, Malkin, Raquel, Hayes, Eller, Cody Glass, Drew O'Connor, Blake Lazat, Nola Achari. Is anybody but Crosby in the same position? Crosby and Eller are the only folks in the same position. So that's how many changes Sullivan has made. I don't know if you saw this last night in the first period when the Penguins were going south. And we've got Francis Anzal. I'm going to bring on uh, Francis here in a moment. I don't, I don't know how many people picked up on it. The Penguins went to the 1-2-2 that they used very early last season to kind of steady and right the ship. Maybe it was two years ago. All the time sort of bleeds and runs together. Uh, And I thought it was passable. The Penguins are not a team that can play a structured team game. They're not that, you know, they think too much. They react. They feel. They're intuitive. And you're asking them to be positional. Uh, It's not going to last long. But it worked for a moment, and, and maybe it has to, maybe they have to resign themselves to not feeling or being intuitive and, and just strip away some parts of their game for a minute. On that, let me get rid of the lines. Francis Anzalone, how the heck are you? Good morning, Dan. I am back from my travels. I, I can- was not. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you now. I I had my okay. I assume the audience could in fact uh, hear you. Very good. How is your battle with Apple this morning? Have you solved the puzzle? Well, I have solved the puzzle enough for the show. I think actually hang on. I have taken us both off the stage somehow. <laughs> there we are. All right. <sighs> You know, doing this on the fly, I, I must uh, both commend myself and spank myself because I, I I was actually in bed until 1130 this morning. I'm so exhausted from the West Coast trip. I wrote two stories and I just yeah. laid there sort of dead to the world. I'm like, I don't want to move. Don't yeah. want to move. Don't want to get up. No, I'm not. Can't make me. Uh, so, so, Francis, you have done some extraordinary work on the coaches debrief videos and to just 
kind of give a reintroduction to a lot of our audience who probably haven't uh, watched them yet, and definitely you should. Uh, you come from a hockey family. Your father, a very successful coach. He put Lake Superior State on the map before becoming a very good minor league coach and then an NHL executive, uh, both with Tampa Bay and Calgary. You went down the coaching path after, you know, after eschewing us broadcasters, although you were a pretty good broadcaster, a very good broadcaster. You you, you said we weren't for you. You went down the coaching path and, and you found yourself now kind of half coach, half uh, hockey school savant, and and you've uh, helped bring some big names to the NHL and, and the professional ranks. Uh, you've been in the coach's room, including the Penguins coach's room, I, I, I might say. Uh, you know, you, you've been in on these coaches meetings and you, you know uh, these people around the league. And, and I think that insight has been hugely uh, beneficial for the audience who've checked out your videos. OK, now that your tires are appropriately pumped. Um, Tell me a, a, a bit about what you're seeing with Mike Sullivan and all of these changes. And is, is it pressure, you know, for his future that he's feeling? Well, I think the core of the article that you wrote here today that I was able to read. Oh, don't pump my it. tires now. No, I, I, I think that the, the, the core of your message is accurate. Your, your points are well laid out as always. I would take a bit of issue with the title of the article. I don't think that Mike Sullivan is necessarily coaching for his job. Um, this is an individual who has two Stanley Cups in the last eight years. He has a number of meaningful relationships inside and outside of the organization. He's one of the top three to five coaches in the game today. It's undeniable. He's one of the three to five highest paid coaches in the game today. He is going to be the United States coach. Mm -hmm. I don't think Mike Sullivan is necessarily coaching for his job. I think Mike Sullivan is coaching to do everything he can to preserve any likelihood that this can be a successful season for the Pittsburgh Penguins. I think the Fair challenge enough. here is at some point um, coaches run out of time and being in place is doing more harm than good. I can remember, Dan, and I'm sure that there's a percentage of the audience that likes this name and a percentage of the audience that doesn't care for the name too much, Brian Burke. Uh, I can remember when he had to let his college roommate and good friend Ron Wilson go as the head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs, as much as it pained him to do it, I remember Burke saying, I wasn't going to send Ron Wilson out on that Air Canada bench one more time. It just wasn't fair to him. It's not in a coach's DNA to quit. It's not in a coach's DNA to step aside. I truly believe Mike Sullivan is doing everything he can to try to find solutions for this team. The challenge that we face is the realities and the inevitabilities. There are no quick fixes. And it's very, very hard for a coach to overcome some of this stuff. So I, I kind of think maybe you, you're maybe reinforcing the, head, the title of of my story a, a little bit there uh because I, I do i feel like he has been in a better mood with us media folks mm -hmm. since day one of training camp and, and i and i kind of feel i i felt from the beginning like okay he's trying to be a little bit more open he's trying to uh be a part of the solution and part of the change and and, cha and part of that had to be there was just a misery a negativity that hung over that locker room mm -hmm. from day one last year. It was just a heavy and dark place after they folded at the end of the 22, 23 season where they were all but a shoe in for the playoffs and they couldn't win any games in the final couple of weeks, eventually mm -hmm. losing to a couple of doormats in Chicago and Columbus. And um, yeah, so I, I kind of felt like he was trying to change and be a part of that, but, I will, yeah, very strongly agree with that. You, sometimes you do run out of time. France, you know, I, I asked Sid, Sidney Crosby, I'm name dropping now. <laughs> I, I asked uh, Crosby last night, you know, he said, okay, we didn't do these things. We have to limit our mistakes. And, and, and I knew I tossed him a grenade and he handled it well with, you know, with, with class. And I said, I know it's a dumb question, but how do you get there? How do you begin to limit these mistakes 
and and turn the corner and and yep. and, and you know get to your 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 better game. And you know he's like, I, I guess his answer was hopefully these bad experiences fast track us. And then he kind of listed a few more things they've they they've done wrong. But how does a team that has eight or nine players in their lineup over thirty? I mean, these guys aren't aren't newbies. They're not rookies learning on the fly. These guys know what what they're doing wrong and, and not to do them. How do you get a team from this haphazard, mistake prone chicken with their head cut off as they track back to the defensive zone into some sort of coordinated bunch that can live up to their potential? Yeah. Well, you need something good to happen. And I believe that right now, the three biggest issues facing the Pittsburgh Penguins from a team perspective, not from an organizational or overall perspective, which is a much different story, as I think you would agree. The three biggest issues are the team is getting average to above average. I will call it collective goaltending. If you combine the goaltending performances of all three, the defensive detail and commitment has been a challenge and there is a lack of finishing on the offense and goal scoring side of things and let me tell you dan that is playing a much bigger role here than anything else the most fun hockey players have is when they score goals and when hockey players don't feel confident that they or their teammates can score it is a massive massive weight on their shoulders I actually don't believe that the biggest issue facing the Pittsburgh Penguins right now is that they lose the lead or lose their grip on the game. I think the biggest issue is they don't think they can get it. I think the biggest issue is the lack of secondary scoring. And so as soon as the Wild score last night to make it two to one, seeds of doubt creep in. Mike Sullivan's challenge What can I do as the coach to try to stem this bleeding, to try to get our bench to change the negative channel that our mental TVs are on? That is the challenge that Mike Sullivan faces. Um, The reality is no team in the National Hockey League uh, every single night is able to play with the lead the entire game. Teams blow leads left and right. Even the team in the National Hockey League that plays the strongest stop and start connected game has players that and come away from it. The challenge right now is when they lose their grip, the grip is gone. They haven't gotten it back, and I believe they can get it back. And that is playing a huge role here, maybe even more than lunging at pucks, missing assignments, or not stopping and starting in the defensive zone. They have to play 95% of the game, 95% of the season, darn near perfect defensively. And that's weighing on these guys. I'll all but guarantee it. All right, Francis, I'm, I've taken you off screen. I'm not sure how I did that. Uh, I just did, did it now here. Uh, let me remove and try to add. There we go. Now, <laughs> I'm learning right. on the fly. But no, I, I, I know you have a meeting at... Um, at one o'clock. I, I just want to thank you for, for hopping on. I want to give you time to prepare for your Uber meeting. I don't mean Uber and driving. I mean, in terms of Uber importance, I'm not doing uh, that as, yet. as a Nietzsche term, Uber mensch, you know, yes. sort of all right. Uh, Francis, we'll look forward to your next uh, coach's debrief. Uh, interesting. I, you know, I, I feel like he's coaching for his job. You feel like he's coaching, for the team, but he'll, he'll, he'll survive this just to maybe put a a yes or no on that. I just don't believe that Mike Sullivan is sitting in the coach's room or looking at himself in the mirror, trying to coach to save his job. I think Mike Sullivan is controlling what he can control. And I think that, um, I think that Mike Sullivan is, is trying to do the best he can for this core, for this fan base, for this organization. And I think for the most part, he is doing the best with what he has available. Uh, There are some things that I think could be done to try to rectify the situation at times, but uh, I don't know how much of my last spiel you heard, but I really do believe, I will leave you with this in the audience to chew on, that the lack of belief in the secondary scoring 
and the ability to come back when the game is slipping away is playing a bigger role than we may think. And I am a big proponent of play away from the puck. And there are certainly some issues there, but there is not a team. Oh, in the there's National our next Hockey video, League. Francis. Yep. There, there, there is not a team in the National Hockey League that plays great defensively for the entire 60 minutes of the, of the game. Think about this, Dan, before I go. Okay. It's almost impossible to hold anyone up anymore. Right. Players, for the most part, want to go, go, go. The game is so reckless and so fast. It's very, very hard, if not impossible, to play prevent defense. The last best example I saw of it was the Florida Panthers for 10 minutes in Game 7 <laughs> against the Edmonton Oilers last year, holding on for dear, dear life, and Bobrovsky had to pull two saves out of his you-know-where. Outside of that, that one special moment, it's darn near impossible to do. Well, you know, I, I do find very uh, find it difficult to explain. And I've had that conversation in the locker room and with Sullivan. You know, it, it's they kind of know that. But I, I think there's still a fan perception. Well, they're up to nothing. Trap. Just start trapping. And, yep. and as, as you're saying, the game is too fast, too open. You, you, you can't do that for long. You, you, you have to check forward and you have to counter punch as quickly as possible. And Sid and Malkin and Latang need to share the counter punch load. And there's just not a lot of secondary depth scoring and offense on this team right now. Now, one thing Mike Sullivan might try moving forward, this is an old trick from the from the uh, from the goodie bag, so to speak. And well, not you've a called lot of it so far. Almost everything that has happened, you've been a step ahead. So let's hear it. Not a lot of coaches do this, Dan, but uh, but I have done it in the past. The minute you can see or feel the game slipping away as a coach, use your timeout. Use your timeout to try to stop the moment. The counter argument is: Well, if we use it now, we won't have it later when maybe we need it. And my response to those people are, it may not matter. There may not be a tomorrow or later in the game. Yeah. So, for example, if the Penguins go up 2-0 against Anaheim tomorrow night and it gets to 2-1 and we can see that doubt creeping in, call a timeout. Call it like you see it as a coach. Remind the players of the two to three things they need to do and tell them it's not happening tonight and stop Anaheim's momentum right then and there. There's other things that we can message. There's other things we can do, but that's an old trick that not a lot of coaches mm -hmm. use, Dan, that, you know, like you said, Dan, he's trying everything. There's just one more for the list. You know, it's funny thing. This is why I'm not an NHL player. Honest to goodness, Francis, if I'm sitting on that bench and, and my team, you know, I'm and this team goes up to nothing, I swear to you, first shift out there, if I'm the first guy out there after a 2 nothing lead or a second shift, the gloves are coming off. Someone's getting punched. It, it just something to distract or or to because it, yeah, they they their worst moments don't come after bad moments. Their worst moments come after good moments. It is the most inexplicable thing. But I know you got to you've got to run. Um, uh, my friend, it I can't believe you posted that picture in the first, the first coach's debrief of you and I, uh, what, 18 years ago in the Johnstown ago. Chiefs press box. <laughs> Many moons ago. Oh, it's been, a, it's been a ride. Francis, thank you so much. Okay, Dan, be well. All right, that was Francis Anzalone, who does the coach's debrief videos. He runs a, a hockey school. And um, if you actually Google him, and if you're, you know, if you have a, a youngin at home who has quite a bit of promise. I definitely would recommend sending him through Francis's school. Um, maybe the Penguins' top prospect is a graduate. I'm just saying. Uh, okay, let's let's get to some of the uh, the questions here. Uh, we've already done 30 minutes, and I haven't even gotten to your questions. I feel like I feel like we're bringing a lot of uh, info in in this, and hopefully, maybe you walk away a little a little more informed and. I think Francis and I are on the same page. Maybe the different different conclusion about uh, Mike Sullivan. Let's go to Austin Curry. At what point does Dubas just say, screw it and tear it all down? Austin, here's my response to that, or the response to that. How? Go down the list and look at the no trade, no movement clauses. 
Dubas would have to literally walk into the locker room and ask every single player if they would, in fact, leave. And if you do tear it down, let, let's just, I mean, because I understand the, the, the hopelessness of, of this situation that many of you are, are feeling. You want the Penguins to win. You want to be see them successful. And you feel like the only way to see that again is to go through the pain. And you don't want to prolong the pain any longer. Let's just do it. Let's get it over with. Rip the Band-Aid off. We, we understand each other. Uh, I have to maintain a certain coverage from a 30,000-foot level of what's happening, what could happen, what should happen, and, and, and kind of combine all of that into uh, the pie. Let's just say he does tear it down. Are you, I mean, you'd have to get Crosby to sign off, basically, because he would have to... I think he, you know, Malkin would look to Crosby and say, should I go? I don't want to go. Latang would look to Crosby and look to Malkin and the, you know, hey, listen, we made a commitment to see this through, through hell or high water. And we're here for the high water. I think that's, there's a bit of that attitude. Now, did they really expect the high water? No, I, I firmly, and I, and I wrote this back in August and, and it was one of my most read columns of the year. And I, I wish I could find it real quickly. I didn't think I'd bring it up. Why does the Penguins Corps want to stay together? This is the part that I don't necessarily understand in, in, in total. I remember Marty St. Louis saying of Steve Stamkos, he's going to love it. He's going to love getting a different perspective in a different city and playing somewhere else. And that, that first game back home and those next few games back at your old home are emotional and they're tough. But in the end, you'll be glad you did it. And, uh, and I, I, I feel like the Penguins core are so entrenched both with the organization and each other that they may have missed the big picture. That everything has an end, and and but but by re-signing with these impossible to move thirty-five plus contracts, let me tell you, there's I would be shocked if there was a team that would give up an asset the Penguins would want that would help the rebuild for Evgeny Malkin. I'd be shocked if anybody really gave up much for Chris Letang. He's, you know, counting right now. He's got four years. He's only two years in to a six-year deal. Who else are you going to move? Uh, you know, Ricard Raquel would have some trade value, I believe. Brian Rust will have some trade value. Rust's no trade clause does expire on July 1. Uh, Lars Eller, Marcus Pedersen have trade value. I think Eller is worth a second round pick all day long. I, I, I thought Marcus Pedersen might be worth a, a first rounder, like, like a Sean Walker sort of late first rounder deal. Team going for the Stanley Cup has a great record, needs some help on defense. Maybe you, you weasel a first rounder for him. His play this year has been a little, you know, shaky. So he's, but he's worth a second rounder all day. Let me ask you, who else is going to fetch anything? Who else makes any money? The rest are, you know, uh, guys making, you know, close to the minimum or a million bucks, you know. Uh, Kevin Hayes, 3.5. St. Louis eating half of that. Rather, I'm sorry, Philadelphia eating half of that through, you know, uh, Penguins, you know, getting the second and third round pick for for Kevin Hayes. So you really can't tear it down, Austin. You can watch it crumble, which uh, I I I hope that you're not uh, all seeing. I feel like there's something yet to come with this team. They can't possibly keep making these mistakes. 
just can't possibly keep doing it. All right. Yeah, I'm doing well, Michael. I'm hanging in there. I've you can tell my voice is probably a little bit beaten up. Uh, that road trip certainly got the better of me. Getting home got the better of me. That, that's for sure. And the funny thing is, I called Delta for my compensation. Delta says, well, we don't have a reservation number for you. And I said, I know because your gate agents left and didn't check me in. Therefore, there is no reservation number because your people left. They said, oh, without a reservation number, we can't, you know, we, we can't document your flight. And I said, I know because you didn't check me in and there was no flight. You left me stranded. So we're going back and forth. <laughs> the computer says this. Yeah, well, Dan stood there and watched his plane take off without him. I digress. Uh, Sid had a rough couple of games last night. He found his game, so that's good. Though I don't know if Sid um, really found his game last night, but I, I, I think the losing is beating him up. I, I you know, he he makes that great back check, and Sid and Malkin. And even Carlson and Latang have had really good third periods in the last couple of games. It's just that the first two periods were full of nonsense, garbage, mistakes. Carlson last night had five turnovers. Five. And those and that stat is typically well underscored as as well. It, it, that that's becoming a problem. We should probably spend some time on that. Uh, if you want, we, I, you know, uh, we can talk about it. Otherwise I should probably do a whole separate video um, on, on EK 65, but they've had a couple of good third periods, just enough, like, like a bad golfer birdies, like the 17th hole or 18th hole, just enough to keep them coming back. And I think that's where the penguins are uh, right now. All right, uh, destination inshore. Do you think Yager could have what it takes to be a head coach? Just thinking about it gives me goosebumps. I think it would really get the fans going and the players. Uh, no. <laughs> I don't mean to. No, the, the, uh, the, the reality. Uh, great players make terrible coaches. What Yager thinks sees and can do or could do or you know thinks is possible is so far beyond what most players see think can do that there's always a disconnect excuse me uh, you know major league baseball is kind of the same sort of uh, of deal yeah, i guess even football how many how many great football players became great coaches no, it's the grunts. It's the guys who have to learn the game from the nuts and bolts, the ground up, the guys who have to love it more than anyone else. They're the ones who make the best coaches. And for you know the Pittsburgh audience, Jim Leland, minor league catcher, one of the best to do it. And uh, you know Joe Torrey, not much of a different uh, situation. You know, not much different, a, a bit different. Uh, I, you know, kind of. I honestly couldn't tell you who the best managers in baseball are right now. The Pirates have so soured me on the game that I have difficulty. I don't. I don't even watch the World Series anymore. I just don't. I just. I don't. I don't care about baseball anymore. So forgive me for making a couple of dated references. Uh. Anyway, you, you have to really, you have to know the game on a different level to be a coach. Like Lars Eller will be a good coach one day i have no doubt on that but yager um i will put that under the idea of fan porn sorry sorry destination uh michael hate to say it is there a way to move ek in a trade he's not looking good at all maybe we can get assets and draft picks uh you will get something back for eric carlson I can confirm, and I and I I haven't written this because it 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 swims. I people would take it as a report, and it's not. 
you know, I, I get taken out of context every time I, I have to really be careful now what I write, the way the internet has changed, the way social media, you know, now that Facebook and Instagram pay people to post my words, uh, a lot of people are doing it to make money. How, how, how terrible is that? Someone can make money on my words and I don't get paid. Uh, you know, shouldn't I get a little slice of that if you're going to, you know, take me out of context? So at risk of being taken out of context again, having, you know, kind of talked to some people around the league, I think there are a few fits for Carlson. But his his de- defense and how he struggled to integrate into the Penguins, which have traditionally been seen as a very easy team to come in and integrate because Crosby is such a, you know, such a good captain and a welcoming captain and a thoughtful, you know, sincere sort, you know, Carlson kind of struggling, you know, coming in has colored his perception a little bit and his, you know, getting 50 or 60 points, People are like, oh, you know, I think people see him in a much different way than they did when he won the Norris Trophy. And so let's just say, let's just say L.A. loses Drew Doughty for the rest of the year. Doughty has a setback and they're looking for a right defenseman to come in and be a stud and all of those sorts of of things. You know, Carlson would be, you know, I think public choice number one. But inside hockey, they're like, well, you know, is this guy going to hurt us more than he's going to help us? Is this guy going to come in and try to do everything his way? Is he, you know, the coaches are going to look at Eric Carlson. When the, when the GM has that conversation, hey, we can get Eric Carlson. I owe Pittsburgh a call back. And the coach is going to say, hell no. I want to be employed in a month or three months. There is some of that. There, there is some trepidation around Eric Carlson, surrounding Eric Carlson around the league. I, I should phrase it properly. I guess I wasn't going to talk about Eric Carlson, and now I am. I, I, I think he is an interesting, intelligent guy who um, has a lot of ideas on how things should go. I think he's... I think he's a bit of a coach killer. Or that that's wrong. Let me retract that. He's not a coach killer, but I, I think he's difficult to coach. And and in that, you have to pound on that square peg a little bit to get it into the round hole. And sometimes you have to modify the hole because the square peg won't change. And you have to fit your team around Carlson. And that presents a lot of challenges that I don't think a lot of teams want to go through, especially not at 10 million bucks. At 10 million, that player better make you a Stanley Cup favorite. I don't think Carlson does that to a lot of teams. So the Penguins can't eat any more salary. You know, it would be a very interesting trade. I do think they could do it if they wanted to. Now, Michael, let's 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 turn that. Now, let's look inward because if we're going to play GM, we have to do it from all sides here. If then else. So we've done the if. Now let's do the n or the then. <laughs> let's say you trade Carlson. Now, who's your right side defenseman? Chris Letang, Jack St. Ivany? St. Ivany is is struggling. In his sophomore year, actually, he's still a rookie, uh, so I shouldn't call it his sophomore year. But for all intents and purposes, it is his sophomore year. And he's kind of going through that sophomore jinx where he's trying to do too much. He's thinking instead of simplifying. And I think Mike Sullivan uh, you know, and I are on agreement, in agreement on that because that's what I've written. And I asked Sullivan on the road trip, you know, highs and lows. He's in and out of the lineup. What do you, you know, what are you seeing there? And and that's what, you know, kind of what he said. He has to simplify his game. Better decisions with the puck. 
I call it trying to do too much. Anyway, uh, so it's St. Ivany. And who's your third pairing right side guy? Ryan Shea? Uh, I don't think they have anybody down in Wilkes-Barre who can really, you know, competently come in for a long period of time and be the right side guy. So now if you move out Carlson, you're not going to get a lot of assets in return. You're not, get, you're not going to recoup your first and second round pick. Uh, so now you have to spend assets to fortify your team. It, it's, it's, it's such a no-win situation. And we probably could spend quite a bit of time on Dubas' moves. If you want to look at uh, the big, you know, why the Penguins are in this predicament, almost exclusively, Kyle Dubas' moves have not worked out. They've all, they've all been pretty good. You know, in, same thing I said about Hextall. In the vacuum, each move could be justified and praised or at least accepted. In the totality of them, I mean, Ryan Graves and Nola, Ch- I, I, I like what Nola Chari brings quite a bit. But they're getting, or they're going to get the same thing from Blake Lazat for, you know, a, a bit less money. They're going to get the same thing, uh, you know, some of the same things from uh, Ponomarev and some of these other guys who are on their way up for a, a lot less and Ryan Graves, and Achari, and Carlson, and signing Tristan Jari to five years, and signing Graves to six years. Um, Michael Bunting seemed to work out. Uh, that's very much in question right now. Uh, none of the prospects that he got in the Gensel trade are banging on the door. As of right now. Although uh, Koivinen showed me a lot in the final preseason game. He, you know, he, he, he seemed to tap into the hidden strengths that all humans possess after an accidental over, overdose of gamma radiation altered his body chemistry. <laughs> you know, he had a pretty, but uh, yeah, it's. And and who did Dubas bring in? And you know Kevin Hayes, I like Hayes. I think Hayes has talent. But last night uh, Mike Sullivan sort of exposed him, putting him in at second line center. That that was dunking him in the deep water, and he was not prepared. I don't know if you noticed this. Uh, Kevin Hayes was benched, played six minutes twenty three seconds after that uh, bit of brutal sort of. Uh, fishing for the puck that led to the tying goal. Let me see if I've got, I I won't be able to load it on quickly. So let's see if I can hold this up to the screen. There, that's, that's what basically got Kevin Hayes benched. That sort of defense. Instead of taking this stride, that's Freddie Goudreau on his backhand. Hayes is a stick length away. Instead of coming to take the puck, contact the man and the body, Hayes lunges. That provided uh, Goudreau time to flip over to his forehand, change direction, and roof a shot past uh, Yoel Blomqvist. And yeah, I think Hayes got three shifts after that. He had a... Uh, Three in the third period. Basically sat the entire second period. Yes, he pulled as well for... um, Yes, he has a bad habit. And I don't think a lot of you see this on television. Yes, he's on the wrong side of the puck quite a bit. Okay, so let's get to some more questions here. You've all... I appreciate you, Mike. Let's see what this one is. Uh, Big Joe... Do I foresee a ton of young players coming up to get their feet wet? And if there is a fire sale, do I think they would ask Russ to waive his no trade? Also love the spirit from St. Ivany. Good for him. Yeah, St. Ivany fighting after Crosby got roughed up a little bit. 
That was the first time. That was the first time in in a in years that somebody has stood up for Crosby. That was St. Ivany's first fight, too. So yes, I, I like Jack St. Ivany uh, a great deal. He's having a tough go this year. There, there's no two questions. Let's get to your 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 primary point though. Uh, there's not going to be a fire sale. There can't be. But would they ask Brian Russ to waive his no trade? Yes. If they're out of the playoff picture, and look, they're at the bottom of the Eastern Conference. Thanksgiving's a few weeks away. They're going to be out of the playoffs unless they go on a massive run right now. You know, at least, I mean, they're going to be out of the playoff picture on Thanksgiving, which is that that somehow is, has become a very good predictor of the end of the season. That never used to be the case. That is a salary cap era thing. You know, in the old NHL, 82 games, guys were just, you know, putting down the cigarettes by Halloween. Not joking, by the way. And I, I'm trying to remember when I was a very young reporter. Oh, who was it that, that kind of laid it out for me? Might have been Kevin Stevens. Uh, might have been Ian Moran. One time he actually kept his clothes on to talk to us. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. But anyway, somebody, you know, that generation, you know, as the Penguins were transitioning from, you know, contending to stinkitude, it was in the middle there before Generation Next really took hold, like 2002, three, whatever. They explained how, how things went. You use the first month, you know, from the start to, to Halloween. You're, you're checking your team, you're checking your game, you're getting into the flow. From Halloween to Thanksgiving, now you're starting to tighten the screws a little bit. From Thanksgiving to Christmas is now when you really begin to hone your game, now you're starting to try to bring it all together. You know, now you're putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, and by Christmas, it's go time. Now you've put it all together, here we go. It's not that way anymore. Now it's you get like two weeks to do all of that. And it's go time because of the shootout and 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 the parody in the league. Oh, yeah, your question. <laughs> I, I hope some of you all appreciate the context or, you know, the, the back stuff. I'm, I'm doing Trump's weave. I'm doing the weave. Uh, maybe I, should, I no, I, I can't do, uh, I can't do Kamala's word salads. Can't do that. Uh, but, uh, to your point about Brian Rust, here's how that shapes up, uh, big Joe. His no trade protection ends on July 1st. He has to know that if this ship sinks, He's not going to be around. And there's no point to him being around. So a trade would be very likely, and he probably, he's smart enough to know that. He's also smart enough to know he brings a lot to the table for some of these teams. And the challenge for Kyle Dubas before July 1st would be getting maximum value for a team that Rust would agree to go to. While he still holds trade protection, he has some say in the process, right? You know, let, let's just use Detroit as a prime example. Detroit right now is playing terrible hockey. They're off to a, a start almost as bad as the Penguins. Uh, they're not getting goaltending. They're not bringing it together. If you want the truth, I think Derek Lalonde is the first coach fired this year. I think uh, he shouldn't be buying green bananas, that's for sure. And, and let's say, you know, a team like that, if they offered a good bit for Rust, that seemed that, you know, I, I think my perception is that would be easy. Rust would say, oh, I get to go home? Sure. That's a place I can raise my family, be comfortable, live after my career. Yes. Let's just say Winnipeg calls with a great offer for Brian Rust. 
And I use Winnipeg not to downgrade Winnipeg. Lovely people. You have to be tough to live in Winnipeg. You, I mean, you have to have a thick skin, figuratively and literally, to, 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 live, to live in Winnipeg. Um, a lot of players just say no. Winnipeg and Edmonton are on almost every no-trade list. Players don't want to go there. I would disagree on Edmonton. I love Edmonton. I would go to Edmonton in a heartbeat. A small, walkable city with great food everywhere. The people are so... Uh, Pitts, Edmonton is Pittsburgh in 1985. And I mean that as the biggest possible compliment. You know, before Pittsburgh kind of became a bit of a transient city with, you know, Facebook and Google coming through and and people throwing money at houses, sight unseen, doubling rent prices and all the stuff, you know. And the, you know, the saying used to be in Pittsburgh, if you need directions, a yinzer will say, follow me. Edmonton is very much uh, like that. Uh, so, but that becomes a challenge. Teams that could use Brian Rust. Brian Rust gets a say in the matter until July 1st. Since his contract runs for a couple or a few more years, he might be like, you know what? I don't want to leave my family for six months, three months, four months, whatever it might be. He's got some youngins at home. He doesn't want to just up and you know uproot and leave them from February through potentially July. You know, end of June when the Stanley Cup is finally awarded so that you know that becomes a challenge uh but yes i i do think if the penguin if the bottom falls out uh rust would be probably the the penguin with the most uh trade value value because his contract is also very affordable at five million or uh you know a couple bucks more see here gable fisk Sully is coach for life in the same way Qaddafi was president for life. Uh, I don't, I don't think Sidney Crosby is going to have to stage a coup. I don't know what you're getting at on that one, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> what are you talking about like a penguin spring? Gable, what are you, what are you doing to me here? Uh, oh, yeah, give Apple what it needs. Yeah, we are. You know, the funny thing is, I as I laid there, my eyes half open this morning, I I actually had to, we're on, we're on the third MacBook I've had to purchase. The MacBook aired it and runs some of the graphics programs I use for Pittsburgh Hockey Now. Took that back for an open box MacBook Pro. Somebody had punted that damn thing, cleaned it up and took it back. So I'm on the road in Edmonton, the keyboard's literally falling apart. I had keys in my wallet because I didn't know what else to do with them. So I took it back. I said, someone screwed y'all. And I started handing them keys from the keyboard. I literally was typing on without keys. So that was number two. And I got this brand new uh, MacBook Pro for way more than I wanted to spend. And I was in, it was in the box literally at 11. Actually, it was in the box at 1210 as I was trying to get the, the MacBook. I was like, I should keep... I should just avoid spending the 1800 bucks. Avoid it. Suffer through, you know, you know it's failing, but wait till after the season and then replace it. And then the damn thing fails right now. So it kind of made my decision for me. And my soul is on its way to meet with Bill Gates. Not Bill Gates. Steve Jobs. I hate Apple. And yet here's my iPhone. Here's my MacBook. My iPad. And they're all synced so I can do different things. And yeah, it's, um, they, they get you. Brandon, <laughs> now that I'm done ranting here, do you think it's worth, do I, do I think it's worth it to just bottom out and go for a top three pick? There's two to three centers that could help the team more next year. And the year after that, another 17th would not. It's not a bad thought. I don't think people would enjoy it. I don't think Crosby, Malkin, Latang would stand for it. But if that's the worst that happens, you know, 
I started the show by saying I was right about something. Now that we got into the hour, hour mark, let me circle back around here. Uh, I, I said to my coworker about a year ago, I've got my hooks into this team. I understand where they are, where they're going, and, and, and what they've got. I, I just, I can feel it. I, I, I know. And, and I was pretty confident in that. So I don't know if, you, if you've been with me for the last 14, 16 months. The thing I've been right about is how the general managers have been making decisions. And, um, and, and how they've been looking at things is what is leading to these mistakes. They have been looking at the team as if Crosby, Malkin, and Latang are constants. A static baseline constant. Eh, wrong. No one has been looking at what's going to become. And, and so, pursuant to that, I've been writing for some time, you know, every now and then, I'll drop it in there, that Evgeny Malkin should move to Crosby's wing. I saw the writing on the wall. I knew Jake Gensel wasn't going to be around. And I wrote, you know, in each of the last two summers, move Malkin to the wing. I think we're seeing, in the last couple of games, the benefits of that. I think it's only it's only going to get better. However, the biggest problem is when you put Malkin on the wing, Malkin, Crosby, Raquel, Malkin, Crosby, Rust, whatever, the rest of the team sucks. I mean, collectively speaking, you're asking people to be a second-line center who aren't a second-line center. You're asking uh, people who, who aren't top six players to be top six players and I, I suppose saying sucks was a bit harsh but when you move people that far above their station out of their role you're going to get results that reflect that and kind of doubling down here this is why i wrote that this was the summer to do it this was the summer to move malkin to the wing and go after one of the centers available on the market. There was Elias Lindholm. Matt Duchesne became a guy who I was really uh, high on. I was kind of down on Matt Duchesne at first. And then I was like, you know what? If that guy can score in Dallas like he's scoring, he can handle a second-line role. And there are, are some other ones out there that the Penguins could have made a move for in the trade market. They, they didn't. And now that they are, in fact, moving Malkin to the wing, hmm, there's no one to play second-line center. I, I think what they're going to have to do is move Lars Eller to second-line center. and I think Lars can at least do a passable job at that. Uh, Drew O'Connor. And I don't know if it's Jesse Pugliarvi who will be the right wing on that line. Maybe Valtteri Pustinen. Pustinen and O'Connor have some sort of weird chemistry that neither of them can explain, but they play really well together. You know, but either way, you know, you're reaching. And then the third line becomes, I've kind of liked Cody Glass in the middle, quite frankly. I mean, he's a bit inconsistent. Cody Glass also from Winnipeg. Busting my balls about busting Winnipeg's balls. He's like, you know, in a joking sort of manner. By the way, Cody Glass, his brother is six foot six, but works as a pharmacist. <laughs> it's like, you guys standing together, do they, do they know which one's the hockey player? Uh, Cody Glass is, if he sticks around, I think you're going to really like him. He is, he is just incredibly personable and he's enjoying the ride and he's 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 a really good sort to uh to talk to i mean he, he he's just a fun guy so um you know I, i'm wishing him the best he's a bit inconsistent right now i, I don't know if that's going to settle in or if that's just who he is uh, you know as a player he's probably your third line center i don't think kevin hayes is a center i think dubas was wrong when I asked uh, this summer after he you know, acquired Kevin Hayes, I said, you know, do you see him as a center or, or a wing? And Duba said, I see him as a center. 
clearly Dubas and Sullivan disagreed because from day one of camp, Hayes was on the wing. And Sullivan was right in that, by the way. I've not seen enough from Hayes in the middle to think he could be successful in that spot. I think he can be successful as a playmaking winger. Maybe he's your third line winger with Cody Glass and Pugliarvi takes that spot or, you know. But I don't think you need to put Nolachari in the top nine. Nolachari is a crash and bang fourth liner. Leave him alone. Leave him there. Last night, putting him on the right wing of the second line and expecting that line to score. Uh, that was that was an interesting decision by Sullivan. No question about it. Crosby is a competitor, says Michael. He's not going to give up. He's going to lead the team like he has for 20 years. And Sid, we trust. Believe me. It's coming. Sid is going to toss the team on his back. No question. All right. Uh, Scott Conrad, they just don't have the players. Age has certainly caught up. The forwards seem lazy. The D is out of position. The goalies, while they've been better, can't make the key save. You know, it's a funny thing about a key, you say key save, Scott. I, I, I generally think you've got a lot of uh, merit in your comment. Don't let me take that away from you. Key saves are, are funny. When you make them, people forget them. It's the one that you let by. Oh, we need to make that key save. Uh, I think Blomqvist and Nedeljkovic, while they've given up goals, excuse me, uh, my, in addition to some other stress-related health issues I'm dealing with, the annual onset of bronchitis is coming at me like a freight train. My voice, um, my, my head anyway. Uh, that and what did I have? Five flights on Sunday and Monday? One, two, three, four, five, yeah. Um, the D out of position. Let, let's, let's focus on that, Scott, uh, because... I'm going to expound upon what you said, not disagree with you. The Penguins' defense is a huge, huge problem. Forwards are going to make mistakes, especially the Penguins' forwards. You have to build a reliable and consistent blue line. Instead, the Penguins have a haphazard scattershot blue line in their own zone. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I think we might be uh, wrapping this up sooner than later. I wanted to give you all your, you know, your full say since I was a bit late and Francis uh, was very good earlier in the show. Uh, yeah, the, the defense has not been close to good enough, like not even close uh, you know, Carlson's whiffs and turnovers and Latang sort of, I don't know if Latang is trying to do too much, you know, trying to take too much responsibility on to his shoulders or, or what the deal is. Uh, but he's not been himself. He's not carrying the puck with the same authority or even the same frequency. There's just something off, which he's such a big part of the Penguins' defense, then it's a problem. I think Matt Grizzlick, over the last five to seven games, has become a problem. In fact, uh, let me go to it. Let's go to the tape. That goal I showed you a little bit earlier with Kevin Hayes lunging. Here is Grizzlick doing the same thing a moment earlier. Now, that's a 50-50 puck. Grizzlick immediately takes a lunging position rather than taking a bold stride. If he puts himself in better position, uh, Freddie Goudreau is now battling for that puck. Hayes has time to collapse on him or doesn't need to at all. And the play is negated. But since everybody was you know, reaching out with their stick, a guy like Frederick Goudreau, who, by the way, resurrected his career with the Penguins during the COVID season, he and Cody Cece both, uh, I thought, could have been uh, kept around. Minnesota's certainly getting uh, good use out of him. 
You know, Goudreau has time to literally connect the puck on his backhand or corral the puck, flip it over to the forehand. And in that time of reaching and poking, where did Grizzly go? Where was, you know, it was just, that's the kind of stuff that, um, you know, I, I, I think a younger Mike Sullivan would probably call everybody into the meeting room and just have at it. Okay, so I'm I'm half an hour behind on the questions here. My my apologies. Uh Chris, this team is a mess. Jari, the team defense, the age of the forwards, they play a system that doesn't match the personnel. Now there, Chris, I'm gonna ask you to explain what you mean. Sid misses Jake. Yes. Carlson isn't good at anything. I'm not gonna go that far. It's just a chaotic mess. Sean, the guy, oh, this guy talking about Francis said Sullivan is not coaching for his job. How is he not on the hot seat? Sullivan's job should be in jeopardy. I don't care what he's done in the past. This team should be doing better than it is. Let me, uh, Sean, I'm going to untangle a little bit there. And I'm I'm just going to explain the situation without opining or, you know, kind of giving you my two cents on the matter. Mike Sullivan uh, very well might be in a little bit of trouble. I I seem to think, if nothing else, he feels that he is. That's my take on it. Um, Fenway Sports Group committed a boatload of money. One second. Okay, glad you didn't hear any of that. Uh, Fenway Sports Group committed a boatload of money to Mike Sullivan. They don't waste money. I'm not calling it FSG cheap. I am saying they invest, and they don't like to lose investments. They want it to pay off. So uh, FSG is, is very confident in Mike Sullivan. So what sort of leeway that buys him on two levels, the personal confidence the owners have in him combined with the financial investment that the owners have in him. That means they trust him to see them through the bad situations. They trust him to make necessary changes. And Sullivan's doing a lot of that right now making a lot of these changes and they trust him that if they're going to make some changes or Dubas is going to make some changes, you know, personnel wise that Sullivan is able to adjust and adapt and and to lead the team to the next step, whatever that might be. That's just the reality. Now I indirectly placed Mike Sullivan on the hot seat because everything is, as I just said it was, until it's not. Until FSG says, oh, geez, attendance is down to 65 70%. What was it uh, last week? Like, like 78% capacity, 80 85% capacity? I mean, the first few games of the season, uh, there were some pretty good chunks of empty seats. And if the team is going like this and Dubas says, listen, I don't know what else to do, uh, then it might happen. Sullivan will be the coach until it's untenable. Untenable might be on the doorstep, however. So that's as well as I can explain it to you. And I, and I hope you kind of accept the, the reality of the situation. The fans can pound the table all they want. Listen, these people didn't become billionaires. And Kyle Dubas didn't ascend to where he is by listening to fans. <coughs> Executives, coaches who listen to fans end up sitting with them. Remember that. Um, Need to bring up some guys from Wilkes that are feeling themselves right now. Poulan to start. Brandon, I think you're going to see Poulan this week. 
My, that's my gut feeling. I, I don't know anything inside. I feel like Poulin's hot start combined with some other guys having, you know, really bad starts combined with Brian Russ's long-term injury. I do expect you'll see uh, Sam Poulin. Plus, he could be the fourth line center. I mean, legitimately. Uh, Lazat and Poulin, and I think I think they might... You know, the question becomes, who do they sacrifice? Pooley Arvey is sort of playing his way off the roster. I mean, that's just how it goes. Um, he might find himself on on uh, waivers. Sullivan should have been fired years ago. Get him. They need a fresh voice. Do they? Do you assume that some other coach is going to come in and the guys are going to say, oh, crap, we better listen to this guy. We better stop making these mistakes, guys. Hey, Sullivan's not here anymore. We can't, we can't make those mistakes now. I mean, there would be a 10-game bump. And for all of you saying this, IR3K, there's going to be a lot of chest pounding. See, we were right. And then after 10 games, you know what's going to happen? You'll be left with the very same Pittsburgh Penguins that uh, you've got now. But IR3 says, I still have faith in the team. I don't think they're as bad as they're playing. They couldn't possibly be as bad as they are playing. That is for sure. Let's get back to Michael. I said a couple of streams ago, if they are out of it by Thanksgiving, what that looks like uh, currently I can see Pedersen gone. Do I feel like he'll be traded come the trade? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I do. Well, Pedersen's actually an interesting case because he's still in his 20s. And you could make a strong case, depending on how much money Pedersen will resign for. You could make a case that Pedersen is a guy that you keep around so that you can try to be competitive sooner than later. I don't know. Uh, the easy thing to do is to flip him for a second round pick, maybe a late first. In fact, that might also be part of the equation, as I say it out loud. Is, um, you know, what's the market value on Pedersen? Is he worth more to you than you'll get? In that case, you know. Uh, new Michael. Bunce can't be on the fourth line. He's a streaky point guy. So when he starts getting points, his confidence will come back. Here's the thing, Michael. He was a top six guy. He was a second line guy playing with Malkin for eight, nine games. And he had one assist. Uh, not just only one assist, but he was wearing the Harry Potter cloak of invisibility. Is that even a thing? I don't know. I don't like Harry Potter. The point being, he was not helping his team at either end of the ice. And so when you say he's not a fourth liner, in theory, you're correct, Michael. In reality, a team desperately trying to win the next game, he is. That's just how he's playing right now. And if the team are winning some games, you can afford to keep bunting in a spot. You can maybe drop him down to the third line, give him a pat on the bum, and say, keep fighting. But when you're fighting for your life, fighting for your season already, you don't have the luxury to coddle a player like that and, and, and go through the struggles. You've got to win now. Got to win now. Because otherwise, whatever happens in a month won't matter. Let's just say you keep bunting in that spot and you're losing games. Bunting gets hot in December, finally. It won't have mattered because, because you know, they lost the games now. And you'll have invested in bunting for, you know, a payoff that doesn't benefit you. Let's go to Robert. What about the salary implications for other teams as well? A lot of the contracts are heavy loaded. Not sure what you're talking about there, Robert, but uh, yeah, if you're talking about like the Penguins roster and the difficulty trading, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's just, you know, the, 
the, the Penguins have have some guys who are well paid. Now, the fortunate thing is the salary cap is going up by a few million again next summer. So a five million dollar contract for a 20 goal scorer next summer, bargain city. Uh, teams know that too. Two second rounders gives us six picks between the first and third round. If our first round pick is a top five pick, I think it is better for Sid and Malkin in their final season. Well, that's like three years from now. I don't. Uh... Hi, Alex. K man rules. Is that me? Hang on one second, once again. And we're back. <laughs> um, hopefully I don't have a, uh, no, no, no boogers on my nose. I don't think. Double checking. I still feel bad about doing that to Rutger McGordy. I, I, I inadvertently posted the video for a short time, so some of you even saw it. Just a big old. Anyway, K-Man rules. I assume that's me. I'm the K. Uh, anyway. Uh, Wayne Gretzky. Did not become a great coach. One of the greatest players ever to lace up a pair of skates. Yager could be good. At this point, Sullivan needs to go. All right. Um, Carlson needs what Kessel had in Tockett. I don't think he has that in Quinn. Listen, if he's not getting that from David Quinn, nobody is going to give that to him. Next year, give... Uh, Brunick a chance? Could he possibly make more mistakes than Carlson is right now? Uh, that's legitimate. I, I, I privately talked with people. I don't think I, I, we might have talked about this on a stream before, but I don't think I ever put it in print for the more serious uh, consumption that I, with Brunick's, training camp and preseason. I wonder if that didn't make uh, Carlson expendable for a very short time. Here's the problem. All right. Here is the big problem. When the preseason games got a little bit serious against NHL competition, Brunick was obviously a juniors player. Could he have made the leap had they, had they kept him? Maybe, but it would have been a risk to keep Harry Brunick, um, Harrison, Harry. Uh, Sullivan calls him Harry. That just sticks in my head. I kind of like the name Harry Brunick better than Harrison. Harry Brunick sounds like an old hockey player. You know, you find him, you know, you find him at the bar at 10 in the morning in Johnstown somewhere. But, uh, it would have been a gamble to keep him because maybe he clicks and gets it, but also maybe his confidence takes a beating and he regresses. Next year is interesting. We'll see. You know, we'll we'll, we'll see. Uh, certainly within two years, though, I think Brunick will be a top four right side defenseman. Mitch, by the way, folks, re-signing has a hyphen in it. Resigning as in to leave, doesn't. So I know what you mean, Mitch. Re-signing Crosby was the worst deal Dubas made. Whatever argument you want to make on Crosby's behalf, I totally understand. He needed to move Crosby and get some first-round picks and a top center. Well, I, I mean, you're not going to keep Malkin and Latang and trade Crosby. That decision had been made. Also, Mitch, don't forget, this is still a business, okay? And and I, I think Dubas had a, a, a legitimate point. Now listen, nobody, nobody caused the Penguins more headaches than I did this past summer because while others reported that Crosby's contract was imminent, I was pumping the brakes. You know, our sources said, hey, pump the brakes. So we pumped the brakes. And 
And, you know, uh, I'm happy to say they were right. Now, to the bigger picture, however, um, I kept questioning why Crosby would resign. But he made that choice. He wanted to be back. And when the game's greatest player wants to play for you, there's a financial aspect. If Crosby weren't there, who the hell would buy tickets to go see this Penguins team? You know, for all the people who say, rebuild, tear it down, you should have to buy season tickets before you can say that. You can't just say, well, call me back when they're winning again, which is what most fans, actually a lot of fans in Pittsburgh do, which is why I'm very worried about what comes next. I've been through this twice before. After the star player leaves, so do the fans in Pittsburgh. I am hopeful that now after 57 years, there is enough of a hockey base here in Pittsburgh, not a Mario base, not a Sydney base, not a Yager base, to sustain the franchise. But every time a star player is left, this team has gone bankrupt. If Sidney Crosby wants to play here and you sell tickets, you do it. If Sidney Crosby wants to stay here and shepherd the young players, there's great value in that as well. And if Sidney freaking Crosby wants to play for only eight million, eight point seven million bucks, well then you take that too. I see what you're saying, Mitch. Uh, as a GM, I would have been trying to nudge the other two out the door. And I I would have been trying to get that rebuild started. By the same token, they got to say Crosby wanted to stay. And and I'm sure ownership was like, well, then they're staying. Because of the, you know, if nothing else, remember the FSG investment idea. And that would, would, you know, it's an investment. Talking as much as... (laughs) <laughs> uh, it, it, um, I don't know if it's a skill or, or what that is. Uh, we, we definitely have a couple of unique presidential candidates and we will leave it at that. I don't want to get into politics because some people can talk objectively and joke and have some fun with it. That's what we used to do in this country. We used to make fun of both of them. Now you can't make fun of my guy. I'm going to tell you how terrible your guy is. Or in this case, gal, whatever. You get what I'm saying. Not everyone's so emotionally invested in their tribe that a joke is seen as an attack. And uh, I come, I'm a Gen Xer. We make fun of everybody. Yeah, so don't piss us off. Eric Bouchard, this year's draft is not the best draft. That's debatable, Eric. It's, It's still coming together. It might lack a generational player, but, um, Right now, people think it's really deep. I digress. They should tank more for 2026. The timing is not good. Gavin McKenna is the next one next year. And the year after, it seems to be Landon DuPont. Well, let's just just pull on that thread. The Penguins' decline is nowhere near rock bottom. If they tear it down now and they get a top pick in 2025, do you think any of these, let's just say they get the very top pick in 2025. Do you really think that player is going to make them a good team again? No. They're going to stink again. I feel like Rob Schneider and uh, the water boy. Oh no, we suck again. It's just, it, it, it's going to be, you know, if, they tank to the point where they get a bottom five pick in 2025. The same for 2026 is almost guaranteed. All right, so don't don't worry about not tanking to try to tank later. Tanking is a few-year process. Will the Penguins have practice at UPMC on Friday and Sunday? Oh, man, what are you asking me these questions for? Look it up. Uh, I don't, I, I'm on a day-to-day basis, kids. I, I thought they might have practiced today. I'd look it up last night. I, I honest to God, I'm, I'm that busy and I'm not Google. 
Uh, this team is probably the worst to allow quality chances. Actually, they are. They are 32nd. So much time within 10 to 20 feet from the net, you could put two Dominic Hashiks in that net, and they wouldn't be able to do anything. That's true. Um, let's see here. We should have re-signed POJ and never went for uh, Grizzlick. You know, uh, I'm starting to wonder that myself. I thought Grizzlick was a more stable version of uh, P.O. Joseph. I'm starting to think now that that uh, was not the case. <coughs> okay. Um, Dan is wearing out here after 90 minutes. So we're going to rapid fire here. Ivan, this team neither win nor give playing time to kids. What's the strategy then? Uh, kids have to earn it. You're talking about Rutger McGroarty. He, he, he got a shot and it really wasn't working. Sending him back to, uh, or sending him to the AHL was the right move. Uh, I can't say that there's anybody else who should have made the team. They, they put the best players on the ice. If you want the players to grow and mature, they're going to have to get real playing time. And they do that at the AHL. And then you kick down the door and you come up and that's how it's, it's supposed to work. Sam Poulan is doing that right now. He's kicking at that door, and I think they're going to give him the shot. If they don't give him the shot, then um, then we can probably talk about uh, what what sort of strategy they are on. I'm looking for all the new people here. Uh, Jesse, or should I call you Yessi? Do I think uh, Jari's injuries are from old injury or struggles are from old injuries? No, no. Jari um, just got on the wrong track and and it's um you know it, it happens to goalies it seemed to really happen to him in a in a pronounced sort of way but it, it is what it is if brunick is as close as he seems a second for Pedersen at the deadline makes sense well they're actually steve uh, brunick is a right defenseman Pedersen, a left defenseman. So those two aren't necessarily uh, connected. Or Pickering. Now there's... Uh, I forget about Owen sometimes. Yeah, I haven't checked in on uh, Owen and, and him up, up there in Wilkes-Barre. But if he's ready, that does accelerate what you can do on, on the left side. Well, that's a heck of a picture there, Caroline. Interesting little Facebook uh, photo. Uh, Sydney should save himself and ask for a trade after this season. That's Carol Ann. Sorry. Uh, it's not going to happen. I think most of us would start to harbor those thoughts. I think I said on Channel 11, we're doing the TV hit one night, that we were asking Sidney Crosby to be far more loyal than I would be. Uh, I, I will stand by that for sure. <laughs> oh i don't know if you were with me this weekend i i uh i teed up some fans like a titleist and i was just swinging away a little bit i kind of uh i reached my fill for a moment bring back the glory days of milan Kraft and kelly buckberger yeah baby all right uh master legacy says this isn't a surprise honestly we all knew it was going to come to an end, same as it did with the Wings. Should have traded Murray. Oh, back in 2017. I love that one. Penguins fans are for Actually, truth be told, I kid you not, uh, I believed this back then. I wrote this back then. Uh, so this is not me second-guessing or driving, but since we're on the topic, uh, I, I was the last one off the mountain saying... You know, keep Mark Andre Fleury. In retrospect, that was the right would have been the right move. The team got too dark, too serious, too. They they weren't having any fun in 2018. Between Sullivan, Crosby, and Murray, there was no life in that locker room. <coughs> they they just um. It it got too heavy. And so when they were tired, there was no one to pick them up. If they beat the Capitals, they win the Stanley Cup again. 
And I, I do believe Murray's flaws were showing by that point. If they had kept Flurry, there would have been someone to screw around and have some fun, and things would have. Um, I, I, I think they actually, I think they would have had a much better chance of winning the cup in 2018 for the three peat. And I don't think 2019 happens where they get just broomed out by the Islanders like they did. So, you know, and I don't think 2021 happens when Jari, um, you know, had another meltdown. No, Murray was in net for the four sweeps for the sweep four against the Islanders in 2019. Jari had the meltdown in uh, 21. Listen, with Flurry and Ned, I don't think that happens. We need Kevin Constantine, Marty Straka, and Kevin Hatcher. <laughs> uh, the Gensel trade really sucked for them, says Daniel. I don't think Sully is the problem. The SID contract guarantees that the Pens thought process is to keep the now ancient core together. Well, yeah, I mean, that's all right, kids. I'm done. My voice is gone. This is getting a bit painful for me. I think an hour and 36 minutes, you got your uh, money's worth. Do me a favor, like, and subscribe. Uh, also join PHN plus this travel starting to really rack up. We spent like 3,500 bucks already. Uh, just the first month of the season, uh, travel, and, and getting around. So uh, do me a favor, uh, help us out where you can. And, and just by joining this little party, you keep us going. So like, subscribe, but also hop on to PHN Plus and, and uh, you know, get the exclusive locker room content, exclusive analysis there, as well as all of the free stories too. That's it. That's all I got. I'm done. I'm out. Have fun.